Hey guys, okay, so this is take two, hopefully this one works. Um, if you saw my post, I just tried to film a video, but something got messed up and the video wasn't actually playing, so hopefully this one's working. Um, this week we're going to look at gene regulation, how certain genes are turned on and off, um, because there are certain genes in, body that, or genes in your body that you wouldn't want on 100% of the time. We'll talk about that in just a second. Today's just an overview. Um, I plan to get into um, the meat of it tomorrow with a simulation that I'd like to do that I think will make, help a lot of this make a lot more sense. Um, since we're looking at DNA and genes and all that stuff, a lot of this is going to be kind of abstract. Um, I think the simulation tomorrow does a really good job of showing you physically like how this works. Um, that being said, if today's is confusing, that's fine. It's mostly just to introduce vocab. Um, and then tomorrow we'll look at what's actually going on, hopefully. Um, and that'll make a little bit more sense. So if nothing else today, I posted three Google Form questions just talking about the three different types of um, genes in regards to like whether you can turn them on and off. So those are on the last part of this PowerPoint. Um, I'll get there once I'm done with this. Um, but if nothing else, try to get those three. And then if the other stuff doesn't make sense, that's fine. We're going to talk about it more in depth tomorrow. So first thing we're going to talk about, again, the purpose of or what we're going to talk about gene regulation is talking about when you turn certain genes on and off. There are certain genes in your body that do not need to be on all the time. There are some genes that do, and we'll get there in a little bit. Um, However, there are certain genes that you would not want present in every cell and you would not want them running all the time. A good example being uh, the genes that are responsible for the formation of enzymes and digestive acids that are formed in your stomach when you digest food. Every cell in your body has the DNA, has the gene to produce that, uh, those enzymes and that acid because all of the cells in your body have the same DNA. You started from one cell and each cell got the same instructions. However, you would not want every cell in your body to always be reading the gene for digestive enzymes and juices because then all of your cells would be producing hydrochloric acid and enzymes that digest proteins and lipids and all that stuff and your body would dissolve which is not good. So there has to be some kind of mechanism for turning these things on and off and there's a, there's a couple different ways this can happen and some of them are more in-depth than we're going to go into for this class but we're going to keep it kind of simple and just talk about the general um, ways that they can turn on and off. So first thing I want to talk about, here's the structural format that we're going to be looking at for the next couple of days. I'll do my best to explain this, but I know it's, again, kind of abstract when you're just looking at this. Hopefully it'll make more sense tomorrow. But basically what we're looking at here is a gene, um, or at least different parts of a gene. Um, and I'll explain what these things do. You've got the uh, regulatory gene promoter and operator, which we're going to talk about at least these two today. I'll try to explain this one a little bit, but it'll make more sense when we do our thing tomorrow, so I'm not going to go too far into it. And then you've got the actual structural genes. So these are the actual genes that code for the protein that we're making. These are more of what's going to re regulate whether it's turned on or off, and we're going to get there. So first thing we're going to talk about is the operator. The operator is the actual part that acts kind of as the lock. Um, so what it does is it is... Er, uh, binds a repressor protein where that repressor protein will either cause the gene to be switched on or off depending on what that operator does. Um, but essentially what this is doing is this is blocking the uh, actual functional genes from being coded. So um, the way you can think of it is kind of like a padlock or a lock on a door. If you don't have a padlock on a door or whatever you're opening, then it's open. It's free to open and shut whenever you can do it at any point in time. However, if you put something in the way of the door, if you put something that's blocking either the lock or the knob or whatever it may be, if it's a deadbolt and it's blocking you from opening the door, um, there's something physically in the way that will not let you move past that point. So it's the same idea here. We have to read these three genes here, the XYZ genes, in order to make a protein. However, if there's something bound here, if there's a big blocky protein in the way that's binding the operator, we can't get to those genes. Those genes are not going to get read. They're not going to be turned on. These will only turn on once that repressor is released and there's nothing in the way here you take that padlock off there's nothing blocking the way anymore and you can move forward um, this thing that comes along that uh, activates the operator is usually called a transcription factor I know that's going to be a term that I think a lot of people are going to forget and I'll try my best to reinforce that term but basically it's the enzyme not the enzyme I keep saying that it's the molecule that causes the gene to turn on or off essentially um, so it's the whole focus of what's being activated or unactivated. So a good example, and the example we're going to look at tomorrow, is uh, lactose. So very common example, everyone knows what lactose is, or at least has heard the term because of people who have lactose intolerance. Lactose is the sugar found in milk, and it is a sugar that is digested by lactase, which is naturally produced by most people, again, unless you're lactose intolerant. Lactase in your body will only be produced if there's lactose present, you wouldn't want to be making 
lactase, if there's no lactose present, it doesn't make sense to waste resources on something that's not there. So that makes lactose the transcription factor. Lactase will only be produced if lactose is present. Same thing with insulin. Insulin is for the met or metabolism of sugar. So when you eat a lot of sugar, high sugar diet, and you have any sugar building up in your blood, you've got high blood sugar, your body will produce insulin in order to metabolize that sugar and lower your blood sugar. But insulin will not be produced all the time. You don't want insulin to be constantly being produced in the body. So um, here's the meat of today. What I would like you to focus on if the rest of this didn't just make sense. Again, I'll come back to the iGene tomorrow, but I want you to focus on... Oh, I didn't talk about the promoter. Um, we're going to focus on these two today. The promoter is essentially kind of think... Or you can think of it like the primer when we were talking about DNA transcription. It is the portion where the ribosome binds and where it's actually going to start reading the gene... Um, which is why the operator usually comes after the promoters because that way it's in the way. So if this operator is bound, you still have ribosomes binding to the promoter, and you'll see this more clearly on the simulation tomorrow, but they can't get past the operator. If you have the operator and the promoter switched, it's like having a, a padlock on an open door. Like The door is locked, but you've already opened the door. It's doing nothing. You can get right through. It only works if the lock is blocking your way, if it's in the way of you opening the door. If the door is already open, then... You can put as many locks on it as you want. It's not going to do anything. Um, again, it'll make a lot more sense if that didn't make sense tomorrow when I show you physically what I'm talking about. Here's the focus of today, though. Here are the three Google Form questions for today. There's three basic types of genes when it comes to regulation. Either the gene is constantly on. It's always on no matter what. Um, we call those constitutive genes. These are usually what are called housekeeping genes because these are genes that are involved in um, very important processes, hence why they're always on. So a good example would be like the um, genes that are responsible for metabolizing oxygen in your body. You constantly need oxygen. If you go more than a couple minutes without oxygen, you're going to pass out. And if you go for even longer than that, you're going to experience organ death and brain death and overall death. So those are genes that you're going to want to have constantly on. There's no reason why they shouldn't be on. Um, the reason I bring this up is because we're going to look in a couple class periods. We're going to see some mutations in which genes can become constitutive when they were not previously. So going back to the lactose example, lactose is not a constitutive gene. However, there could be a mutation that would turn that gene on all the time and it would be constantly producing lactase, which uh, would not be a good thing. It would cause problems. Next one is an inducible gene. Um, it's what it sounds like if you are inducing something, if you are inducing a reaction, something you're causing something to happen. So an inducible gene is one that you can turn on. It's in a natural off state. You can think of it like a light, light switch where you enter room, the lights are off, and you have to turn the lights on. Uh, again, another example, like I keep going back to, is lactose. If there is no lactose present in the body, that gene is off. There is nothing being coded for. It only turns on when there is lactose present because we need to start producing that enzyme that will digest the lactose. Um, these molecules that turn genes on are most often referred to as activators because they're activating the gene. So in this example, lactose is an activator. It's turning the gene on and causing it to code, as opposed to our next example, which are repressible genes. These are the opposite. You come into a room and the lights are already on, and you flip the lights off, so the gene is naturally being read, um, but it can be turned off by some kind of uh, substance in the body, and these are most often called inhibitors because they're turning the gene off. These often occur in genes where it is producing a vital substance that needs to be in a certain concentration in the body, but once you exceed that concentration, it needs to shut off. So imagine that you need to produce a certain amount of uh, hemoglobin in your blood. For example, hemoglobin is the molecule that binds the oxygen in your blood and helps it circ circulate. You need to have a certain level in your body in order to have good oxygen circulation. However, if you have too much of it, it can cause problems. So we need to have a, a nice balance. It's like a Goldilocks and three bears kind of situation where you don't have too much, but you don't want to have too little. So normally that's going to be constantly being produced. You're constantly producing hemoglobin because you have to replace any that's being degraded or worn out or whatever. Um, so normally this is constantly on. It's going to be in the on position by default. However, um, over time, if you get to a certain point where you have too much hemoglobin in the blood, the, blood, the body's going to be like, okay, we're past where we need to be. Let's shut it down a little bit and when we'll turn back on when we start to run out of hemoglobin. Another common example is tryptophan, which is the stuff in Turkey um, that you eat during Thanksgiving. Your body naturally produces tryptophan, but it does need to have some level of tryptophan that's being produced in the body. So if, for example, let's say you're having a diet that doesn't include a lot of tryptophan, your body's going to be producing the tryptophan that you don't make, or that you're not eating. 
However, if you have a really high tryptophan diet, all of a sudden, let's say it's Thanksgiving and you're eating as much as you can, your body's going to be like, okay, we got a whole lot of tryptophan out of nowhere. We don't need any more. We're going to turn this gene off for a while. We're going to metabolize the tryptophan that we have, and then we'll turn it back on once we start to run low. Um, we'll have a couple examples of that. But anyway, hopefully those three examples make sense for today. I want to keep it short. Again, if nothing else, I really do think that the simulation tomorrow will be a really good visual representation of what I'm talking about. I like it a lot. Hopefully it still works. Um, I'm going to look at that today. But either way, um, the questions for today are just about these three to make sure that you understand and also just to make sure that you're participating. Um, but let me know if you have questions about any of these, if any of this doesn't make sense, and we will move on tomorrow. So thanks, guys.